Let's continue on our discussion on the problem of evil and suffering from the logical and the intellectual perspective. Let's go back to our definition of evil. The nature of evil, as we mentioned, is the loss of good. Evil does not have any ontological properties. It is only defined in relation to good. So logically speaking, and from our own experiences, we can define evil in two ways. Firstly, the loss and corruption and deviation or departure from good. Secondly, a departure from what ought to be, from purpose. Now, the first definition, which is the loss or departure of good, presupposes a standard of goodness. The second definition, a departure from what ought to be, presupposes a purpose or design. Both point good and purpose. Both point to God whose character is the standard of goodness and who is the designer of the universe. So by defining evil, we realize that it indirectly points to a standard of goodness by which we can define evil as a departure of goodness and a design or a designer that created this design where evil is again a departure of what things ought to be or that design. Christianity is the only religion that accepts the reality of evil and suffering. It also explains both the purpose and the cause of evil and suffering. And not only that, but it offers God-given strength to survive evil and suffering. It not only accepts, but it explains and it gives us the tools to cope with suffering. Now, let's move on to another subject regarding the problem of evil and suffering. And I call this subject the greater good and our limited perspective. Saint Irenaeus said from the second century, he said, God has permitted evil in order to bring about a greater good. Those things which appear evil only appear that way because of our limited perspective. But when viewed as a whole, that which appears to be evil ultimately contributes to the greater good or the good for all. And we're all familiar with the scriptural references and I will share with you some that speak directly to this point. Most commonly used and loved verse, Romans 8, 28, St. Paul says, and we know, that's an affirmation right there, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. He said, all things work together for good. St. Paul also said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And we're also familiar with the story of Joseph in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph says, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to save many people alive. So God will bring from what seems to be evil something that is good for the entire creation brings good out of what seems to be evil and if you were to contemplate on the worst evil that was ever experienced on the face of this planet 
your minds will probably take you to the day on which an innocent man was crucified. That is the worst evil that was ever committed. What's interesting is that Christians, on the day, or when they celebrate the day on which their Lord was crucified, they call it Good Friday. Because God has brought salvation and life and redemption on the day the worst evil was committed. Here is how we see good coming out of evil. And we're all familiar with the example of Job in the Old Testament. For 38 chapters, Job demanded an answer for all his calamities and, and all the tragedies that, um, that struck him. Instead of providing answers for all his questions, God asked him over 66 questions. And he said, Job, where were you when I did this and this and that relative to all the creations, when I laid the foundation of the earth, or when I, when I, struck, when I designed this and designed that? Where were you, Job? Now, these questions were meant to convey two very important truths. One for Job, or about Job rather, and one about God. The truth about Job is that he has limited perspective. He doesn't know. The truth about God is that he is the sovereign creator of all, who has the power to create all of these things and pay attention to all the details of the world. So the message for Job was very simple. You have limited perspective. You don't know what I am doing. A lot of times we ask ourselves when we are going through evil and suffering in our, in our lives, personally speaking, and we run immediately with our mind to the question, why? Why are you allowing all this to happen in the midst of the coronavirus outbreak? Why is God doing this? Why is God doing that? I repeat and I say always, and I remind myself and I say this, the most supreme level of knowledge is the knowledge of our ignorance. We must come to realize that we don't know the answer to these questions. So instead of looking back for an explanation, it is far more profitable and edifying and constructive to look forward for the purpose, not so much look back for the explanation. And we all know what happened with Job. He learned a very valuable lesson. He said in Job chapter 42, verses 1 and following, he said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. And here's how he ended his prayer. He said, I have heard of you, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. What a valuable lesson Job has learned. What is that lesson? I am not God. God is God. And I need to be reminded that I have a limited, finite perspective. And that's what St. Irenaeus refers to as to the limited perspective and God working bringing forth a greater good, limited perspective that I have and the greater perspective that God has. And we need to do one thing and one thing only, trust him, knowing that he knows what he's doing as an all loving, all powerful and all knowing God. So now we have a one, an additional divine attribute. If you recall in previous sessions, we said that God is all loving and God is all powerful. Well, now we have an additional attribute, divine attribute to that. We also add to these attributes, God is all knowing. He's not only all loving, not only is he all powerful, but he is all knowing. So let us summarize 
logically speaking, what we have been saying so far. We have been saying that God is all-knowing, which means He knows the end of everything. We also said that God is all-loving. Logically, it follows that God wants to bring everything to a good end. We also said that God is all-powerful, which means God can bring everything to a good end. Conclusion, therefore, all things will come to a good end. If we, with conviction, believe that God is all-loving, God is all-knowing, God is all-powerful, the conclusion will inevitably be everything will come to a good end. And this is the conclusion St. Paul arrived at. All things work together for good for those who love God. Why? Because I know God knows everything. I know He's powerful. He can do everything that is logically possible. And I know that God is all-knowing and He knows the end of everything. What else do I know? I have a limited, finite perspective.